This, welcome to another edition of Mississippi Stories. I'm your host, Marshall Ramsey, editor at large at Mississippi Today. You can check out other great Mississippi stories at mississippitoday.org, or you can see my cartoons or a lot of other great things. And by the way, there is a now Marshall Ramsey newsletter that you can sign up for as well. I tell you what, um, I've been following this, our guest today for over 20 years. Um, he ran for governor in 1999, and I think I may have even drawn a cartoon or two about him along the way, but he is yeah. now the mayor of Natchez, Mississippi, and he's been the mayor for the last year and had a really good year on top of some weird things happening too. There's been a few challenges, but a lot of great things as well. We have Dan Gibson's with us. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's good to see you again. How are you? <laughs> Hello, Marshall. It is great to see you, my friend. Yeah, you know, I, I said the, the few weird things that happened. You had Hurricane Delta, which is never fun when you're a mayor because suddenly you've got damage all over the city you have to pick up. You had the COVID crisis, which of course hit, hit the pocketbooks early on, right as you were getting into office, you were suddenly having to deal with how are we gonna pay the bills? And That's then right. you got COVID, which thankfully you're okay. You made it through that okay. And then we had the ice storm, which hit particularly hard down in Natchez. And so you've had some challenges, but you've had an awful lot of success. And yeah. I've talked, talked to a lot of people that I know in Natchez that have been absolutely thrilled with your tenure so far. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marshall. And, and you know, throw in another hurricane. We actually had two. Oh, kind that's crazy. right. Crazy. I, yeah. You just can't make this stuff up. I mean, <laughs> um, and a lot of people questioned my sanity and I questioned it as well. Why I would be running for this office during such a challenging time in America. But Marshall has proven to be a good time and we're excited about everything happening in Natchez. Well, we've got a lot of things to unpack over the next 45 minutes to an hour, but I think a good place to begin would be with you. And, you know, I really didn't know much about you before you know you became a political figure and so forth but I, I found it interesting that you've always been kind of invested in the bed and breakfast industry and you know your family had I guess owned Cedar Grove over in Vicksburg and I know you well, were part of we that didn't early own it. they what's wanted that? to own it <laughs> what's that my dad was a letter carrier and my mother was a homemaker who oh, had wow. great ambitions and uh, my and, and so we had a, a very dear friend who was uh, here in Natchez at the time, Buzz Parker, and Buzz and his family had Cedar Grove there okay. in Vicksburg and taught my mom into operating it for about a year and trying to do some lease purchase. And it didn't work out, Marshall, but I guess that is where the bug bit me. I was in high school, my senior year of high school, actually commuting, if you can believe it or not, from Vicksburg to Jackson where I was at Murrow High School. Um, it was a great experience. It opened a lot of doors for me, uh, being able to uh, see that side of life. Definitely, well, that's really neat about your parents. And I'm sorry, I got the, the initial part of it incorrect, but that, that also, I guess, kind of gave you a little bit of a bug of becoming an entrepreneur. You left Mur Murrow, you went to um, Mississippi State University, you were student body president there. So that was your first taste of politics, I guess and you got a business degree. What did you think, what did 20-year-old what did Dan Gibson think that the rest of his life was gonna be? Well, I, I, I will tell you this. Um, I wrote an epitaph when I was in high school. It was an assignment. And to this day, it still is the epitaph I would choose. And it was, uh, um, he was, uh, he lived to serve and served to live. And of his part, he tried to give and give he did. I just have always loved people. I've always felt a call to service, whether it be uh, in just uh, a little neighborhood club or on a larger scale, such in, you know, as mayor of Natchez. I just want to give back, Marshall. Life has been so good for me and I'm blessed. And so it's a real blessing to give back. You are a wonderful piano player and I've seen multiple videos of you playing and you play in all kinds of different styles. There's, you're, not, you're not just mayor one note on that, but was, I mean, was, was that something you did as a young kid? You had to go to piano lessons or when did you get this, this, this I, urge to play I, music? I started, I started uh, messing around with the piano on my uncle's porch. 
I, I, it's weird. I don't know why they had the piano on the porch. I was four years old and they were just shutting the door because they didn't want to hear all that racket. And uh, one, one day my mother said, I started, I started playing hymns. I was picking them out by ear and they decided to leave the door open. <laughs> Next thing you know, uh, I'm playing the piano. Um, and it has been a real solace in my life. Now I grew up studying classical, but over the years I've really developed my ear more uh, for uh, gospel uh, music. And I really kind of got my start um, playing by ear for church and playing a lot of gospel music. But then I moved into, you know, the other genres and really I do love it all. I don't know that I'm proficient uh, in every genre, but I sure love it all. Yeah, I think you're pretty, you're, you're proficient enough for most of us. I think you, you do pretty <laughs> well at that. Thank you. When you were, when you were elected mayor back a million and a half years ago at, in Crystal Springs, what were some, because you own the Willing House down there, if I remember correctly. Uh, that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah, you've done your homework, Marshall. Yeah, just, just basically, well, and part of it's just my, my really bad memory, but um, what made you want to run for mayor at that time, and what lessons did you learn as mayor then that you carry today? Man, that's a good question. I, um, well, you know, again, I'd always wanted to be involved in public service. And I was 30 years old and we had a mayor, a great guy who had decided to uh, retire and resign with a couple of years left in his term. And I had a little insurance business there in Crystal Springs. And I thought, you know, man, um, it'd be good to uh, get my name out there. But I actually didn't set out to run for mayor at first. I was trying to encourage other people to run and nobody wanted to run. And I thought, well, yeah, this would be some good free publicity to get out there, run for mayor. I'd only lived in Crystal Springs a couple of years at the time. So I got out there and I decided to file papers to run. And then lo and behold, everybody I've been trying to talk into running, they decided to run too. And, uh, but I, I just worked real hard, went door to door. And my, my main goal was I wanted to uh, bring about a better situation in Crystal Springs for our young people. I wanted to have better communication with our citizens, a better structure of government. And uh, I surprised everyone, including myself, when I got elected. And for a time there, I, I was the youngest uh, mayor in Mississippi, just for a short time. And that was really an exciting time. But the very first thing I did when I was elected mayor of Crystal Springs is probably what to this day I'm proudest of. Uh, we formed a, a parks and recreation department uh, we did not have one, and we appointed the first ever Parks and Recreation Director for the city of Crystal Springs, and that person was Sally Garland, who is now a fantastic mayor of Crystal Springs, so that, that's neat. Now, what did I learn? Uh, I learned a lot then that's helped me now. Uh, I learned you have to be patient with people. You have to listen to people. When I was 30, uh, I, I was, uh, I, my hair was fire engine red, and I think I sometimes had a temper to match it. And I've mellowed over the years, and I've learned that I'm not always the, the one that's right. Um, my, best, uh, uh, my best strategy has to be to find consensus, not to be the one that's right, but to be the one that listens and then ultimately steers everyone to a better path. Man, that's a pretty hard leap to make for most people to be able to grow like that. What, what challenges in your life do you think helped humble you to the point where you realize that, you know what, there's gotta be a better way to be a leader? Uh, if anyone has been humbled, Dan Gibson has been humbled. Marshall, if you do your research on me, it's not all it's, it's not all good. I, you know, yes, I, I was very flattered when I was 34 years old to be enticed to run for governor, and I did. Uh, I think everyone knows I didn't win that election. Um, I think everyone knows also I put a lot into that and ended up uh, pretty much broke. Um, I had to reinvent myself, my life. But that experience opened a lot of doors for me, and I will always be grateful that I ran for governor at an early age because it truly framed the rest of my life and their relationships now and experiences I've had that never would have had. But 
that was a humbling experience at 34 to uh, to to pretty much have to start over. I and I brought it on myself, but I truly believe God was in it because He uses experiences to humble us in order to make us better and to make us more aligned to His purpose. And that has uh, been my life. I I went through divorce, um, and I'll just say this: not not just once. Um, you know, my brother, one of my older brothers used to kid me when I was a kid because my middle name is Marion, M-A-R-I-O-N, after my grandfather, George Marion Gibson, a farmer in Utica. And he would say, Dan, the Marion man. And, you know, it kind of unfortunately jinxed me. Um, and that will humble you. That will humble you. And then having to raise a child by yourself and being a single dad for a number of years. And, you know, that will humble you. Uh, but the end result of all of this is I've got a great son who's 27 and we are very dear friends. And in fact, we had supper just a couple nights ago. And I'm just so grateful for Clark, um, who is truly a great blessing in my life. I get emotional, but Marshall, I want to tell you this. Um, I went through a divorce. In uh, someone I loved dearly um, decided they wanted something else in life. And that was late 2015. And I may be getting a little personal, but I was uh, suddenly alone and had already become an empty nester. And that's a humbling thing. Um, and it's then that I decided, well, I'll start spending my weekends in Natchez. And I came to Natchez for the weekend right around Thanksgiving, fall of 2015. Played all weekend at Monmouth Historic Inn and just lost myself in music and friends. And I decided to do a repeat the next weekend, the next weekend. And next thing you know, 2016, I start buying some houses here. And it was just gonna be a temporary thing. I mean, a weekend thing. I was still gonna do what I was doing in Jackson. I become a lobbyist, you know, and, and uh, and it was a humbling time that the Lord used to open a whole new chapter of my life. And I'm very grateful for it. And um, never saw myself becoming mayor of Natchez. So anyway, there you have it. No, a lot I mean, of yeah. humble pie, but it's all for then for a good, good purpose, I guess. No, Dan, I'm really glad to hear that because I remember when you were going through that and some of it made the news and, and that was tough to have your personal life spread on the news. You hate to see that. But I'm yeah. glad to see that you're there. And I know Natchez is glad you're there. Um, you know, you, you bring up being a lobbyist. And, you know, the guy you ran against in, in 99, one of, the, one of the people who it was also a lobbyist. And his lobbying skills really paid off really well for Mississippi, particularly after Katrina. Um, and your lobbying skills, from what I understand, have really paid off for Natchez. How, how does that help when you're a mayor to have a really nice thick Rolodex to be able to pull out names and, and get people in. Marshall, it's amazing. It really is amazing. And I, I'm, I, I'm really humbled by it because I had no idea over the course of all these years, I was lobbying in the work comp industry and the health industry and, and workplace safety industry and had gotten to know so many wonderful people. And we've got great people. Democrat, Republican, Black, White, male, female, at our capital, all up the, uh, the ranks, all the way to Washington. And I had no idea how these friendships and relationships would come to mean so much for Natchez now. And that is one of the reasons people around here were asking me to run for mayor. I was hesitant to run because I love that lobbying life. It was fun. And it, I was on the low end of it. I wasn't a high paid lobbyist by any means, but I sure didn't enjoy that life in Jackson, uh, getting to know so many people. I didn't, I didn't really want to leave it, to be honest. Uh, but it seemed that I had an opportunity to help and serve Natchez. And it has paid off so much. Uh, millions of dollars already just in our first year. Um, business, new business contracts, new businesses opening, new new businesses coming. We have so much on the works and I can talk about that in a minute, but let me just give you one example of how this has paid off. Uh, just two weeks ago, we had a meeting here at City Hall, a dire situation about to lose a major portion of our bluff. And over a course of terrific rains, 
uh, through April into May, we were losing a major, major section across from our city cemetery, right behind Weymouth Hall, one of the major mansions here in Natchez. What we thought was gonna be a hundred thousand plus dollar fix had gone to 400,000 and then overnight by May, a $1.6 million fix. And we sat in my office, it was four o'clock in the afternoon uh, on a Monday, everybody, where are we gonna get it? Where are we gonna get it? 1.6 million, we're about to lose Cemetery Road. I said, folks, we're not, this is not gonna happen under our watch. And at 4 p.m. on a Monday, we got on the phone and we called our, our lobbyist, a good friend of mine, former Congressman Greg Paul Carpenter. We reached out to a good friend of ours, good friend, Senator Roger Wicker, good friend, Michael Guest, good friend, Cindy Hyde Smith. We made all these calls, got connected to our local director here in Mississippi over the uh, uh, Resource uh, uh, Conservation Service, uh, NRCS, uh, that handles erosion projects. Uh, we, by the next morning, eight o'clock the next morning, have been awarded 1.2 million to go along with our 400,000 match. And we already had that in the city because we've been putting money aside uh, for rainy days. And this was a rainy day. And I then got the calls on Tuesday and I just couldn't believe it. But we were told that that was the fastest and largest award in the history of the NRCS, the program that administers funding to local municipalities to fight erosion. That would never have happened had it not been for the relationships we had built with some wonderful people along the years. I'm just grateful. That, that, that fix, how long is it gonna take to get it fixed so that you- They're on the ground working now and uh, they will be finished, we hope, within the next couple months definitely long before we uh, hit our rainy season in the fall. Definitely. You know, you're on your one year in office. It's hard to believe. It's like this year has gone by so fast. Uh, it really has. And of course, I know um, we're now in, you know, pandemic time, which doesn't, you know, there is no time right now. A couple things I I've noticed, um, and, and I'll say this about Natchez. You know, we I went down, I guess, maybe four years ago, three years ago, and we filmed several episodes of, of my television show conversations down in Natchez and Regina Chabernal was nice enough to host us and we filmed at Twin Oaks and and um, you know we, we interviewed her and interviewed several different people from Natchez and, I, and I'll tell you this that before you came into office there was this energy there in the town that wanted it to succeed how how easy has it been for you as a leader to be able to tap into that energy? Because like I said, I mean, you get you get people like Greg Isles, you get people, you know, there you got Tay Taylor, you got Regina, you've got the Chesney and Mark Doyle that I mean that I know that all yeah. are like 100 percent Natchez. They want to bring the whole world there. How how easy is it to work with civic people like that that want wow. the city to go forward? I tell you, Marshall, it's been the easiest thing in the world. It's been great. People, people would say, gosh, it's got to be hard doing all this stuff. No, actually, it's been easy because there was a sleeping giant of great faith, hope, and optimism already here in Natchez. All we had to do was wake it up. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what we've done. And you just named some great people there, Mark and, and Chesney, uh, Greg Isles. I'm addicted to his books, of course, and he's a real inspiration to me. Uh, Regina, golly, and, and I've enjoyed so many great visits with Regina and great food and great conversation. And you mentioned uh, John uh, Norris, Tate Taylor, and, and there's so many other names we could spend all day talking about. The great names and the great talent we have in Natchez. I truly believe there has to be more talent and more enthusiasm and more vision in this small city per capita than any other city in the United States. I'm blown away by it. And it will wear you out. I find that I'm working sometimes 14 hour days, but Marshall, I don't even consider it work because it's so fun, because the, the vibe is so good, it's so strong and it's so great. But this is what I'm most excited about. Marshall, what I'm most excited about is this vibe is a vibe of unity. 
it's not just one side of Natchez and it's not just one demographic. You know, we worked real hard when we ran for mayor to make sure it was a campaign built around unity. And uh, that goal was that we would bring all of Natchez together. Before I ran for mayor, I had had the opportunity to befriend a gentleman in our community who became a dear friend, mentor, and pastor to me. His name, Kevin Deason. Now, Kevin passed away of cancer in 2019, ironically, when he was helping us raise thousands of dollars in the Real Men Wear Pink competition. And he was our real man the very year that he had cancer. Uh, Kevin asked me to be his associate pastor in an African-American church, non-denominational church, and I served in that role for three years. And I saw there that we had an opportunity in Natchez that a lot of other towns may not have. And that was to really bring people together because they were already together. They were already at a point where so much progress had gone before. And right now, we are celebrating a unity here like we've never seen. Uh, just last night, we had a Board of Aldermen meeting where we passed unanimously, almost 2 million in recreational improvements in all of our parks. And there was no discussion as to, well, this park's getting more than this one. Uh-oh, this one's getting better than this one. Or no, it's for everybody. And, and I think as the community sees this and sees us approaching the entire community, opportunity for everyone, I think they're all excited. It's not about black, white, it's not about Republican, Democrat. It's about all of us being in one accord for the common good. Marshall, I just got to tell you this. We sit on the bluff at Inauguration Day, July 24th, 2020, and we said it's about opportunity. It's about community. But it all boils down to unity. And without unity, you can have neither community nor opportunity. And we're living that out. Dan, I know when you, you went into office, you had a long list of to-dos, and I know you've knocked a lot of them off of it. I mean, you've had a very busy year. Tell us right now, I mean, you know, when I was interviewing Tate, Tate was talking about, you know, there are some challenges, obviously. You've got um, issues with, with what's going on and, you know, with education, trying to build back up the schools to help, because he's working really hard to draw people in and so forth. You, from your position as mayor, what do you see as the biggest challenges that Natchez faces in just even in the remaining time of your term and into the near future? I think definitely continuing to work on education is a major challenge, but I prefer to see it as a major opportunity. And one of the very first things that I did when I became mayor was to reach out to our local school board and to develop a relationship with our superintendent of education, Mr. Fred. Butcher, our assistant superintendent, Ms. Zan McDonald, the director of our career tech program here, the, the Fallon Center, which is a great jobs, workplace uh, education program we have here, Mr. Cleveland Moore. And we, we said, you know, we want to partner with you guys because we see the future of education not just being traditional classroom, but we see it as being workforce education. And so that has resulted in a great relationship between the city, the schools, the Board of Education, and also the county. We brought the county into the mix. And then we brought Colin, our local community college, into the mix. We're also bringing Alcorn into the mix. Just uh, inaugurated a new president there, Felicia Nave, who's an outstanding, uh, sta outstanding uh, woman uh, educator there at Alcorn. We, we're, we're building this, and actually, uh, just about three weeks ago, we made a trip to baseball to tour what they're doing with an old outlet mall to create a state-of-the-art job training center, and the school board has now offered the community a great building called the Steckler Building on the campus of our high school, and we are now working on a way we can mimic what baseball has done and in partnership with the school, board supervisors, the city, Colin, Alcorn, and also our local industry, that we can build job training there 
for Natchez. And something historic happened just last Tuesday at the school board meeting. We haven't had a chance to brag about it because we want to brag on the school board for doing this. But even though this is at the public school, the school board last Tuesday, talk about unity in the community. Our school board last Tuesday voted unanimously to open their career center to every private school in our region. And that is historic and truly awesome. And so that's how we're working on education. You know, Dan, um, I remember when we were there filming, you know, one of the, the riverboat came in and suddenly they seemed like somebody kicked over an ant nest. It was wonderful. There were people just everywhere all over downtown Natchez and everything. And I know that's a big part of your economy. It's, it's nice to have that. You now have, you're going to have two riverboat, two riverboat companies coming in. I saw where yeah. you're, you're raising South Street up to 62 feet uh, and going to just help the docks and everything. Tell us a little bit about the details of that, because that's really exciting and that's really big news for the city. Marshall, that's been one of our most exciting projects. And in fact, last night, uh, we had, we made a lot of history at our board meeting last night. We also last night approved a contract with Volkert Engineering, a well-renowned engineering firm that is now going to assist the city in making the plans for the raising of historic Silver Street. In our over 300 years, we are the oldest city on the Mississippi River. We're on the highest bluff. We are the oldest municipality in Mississippi. And yet every year or so, every few years, for our over 300 years, that area under the hill is flooded. Silver Street, under our watch, will never flood again, we hope. And so we have put plans in place to raise Silver Street in its lowest area as you said, to a level where it will be higher than where the historic flood of 2011 occurred when it reached 62 feet. And uh, the beauty of this is we're getting the river boats to help us do it. Uh, we just signed leases with the American Cruise Lines Riverboat Company. And uh, American Cruise Lines has a fleet of great ships, not to be confused with American Queen. That's another company that we already have in the um, online. They, they've been running the river and, and they're landing here. We signed American Cruise Lines and then we also signed Viking. Have you ever heard of Viking? We're so excited about Viking. And they are giving the city half a million dollars, which we will match, uh, 250 from American Cruise Lines, 250 from Viking. And then we're, we'll be looking at American Queen for some support as well. So this is really the great news. When I first became mayor a few months ago, actually it's been 10 months ago, uh, we were hoping we could get uh, a major grant to get federal money to build a dock under the hill. We didn't get that. And I said, well, we don't have to have the federal government do this for us. Why don't we look to those who are truly motivated to bring people here and let them do it. And so Viking, and American Cruise Lines, Viking had already been talking to the city. American Cruise Lines had been coming here a long time. They've now signed deals with the city to build at their expense, their own docks, million dollar docks, multi-million dollars, and to help us raise Silver Street. This will all take place, we hope, by summer to fall of 2022. And what's so significant, Marshall, you said you were here the river boats come and it's like kicking over an ant bed and people are everywhere. That's a great analogy. Your creative cartoonist mind can only think that up. It's really what it is, but it's even more now. We uh, had a signing on the bluff two weeks ago with the CEOs of these major companies and they announced to us that more ships are being built. They're already selling out cruises. And the forecast is that Natchez will be hosting over two thousand tourists per week oh that's great by next summer that's tremendous for our local economy that, that's wonderful and that T tell us some about some of the developments going on there because tate you know tate and i talked about that in his interview and some of the things that he's working on and of course it's always nice too when he films a movie in natchez and you start saying you know that gives you some tourism chops you know when people come and say oh yeah i saw this in a movie but talk about yeah. some of the development that you're proud about that's gone on in the in the past few months. Wow, I tell you what, 
Let's start, Marshall, by talking about our mutual friend, Tate Taylor. Tate, Tate is a guy who grew up in Jackson. I believe went to Jackson Prep. A lot of people in Jackson know Tate. And he, he went off to uh, California to follow his dream. Uh, he, he did not have all the means you would think he had. He actually had to find a roommate. And the two of them struggled. And, uh, and the two of them made it. And that roommate happened to be Octavia Spencer, best known for her starring role, role in The Help. Uh, Tate and Octavia currently now share the cover of the new Mississippi Travel Magazine. We had an unveiling of that cover right here in Natchez just a few months ago. And it was so exciting to stand there with Tate Taylor, who is a self-made success story, if ever there was one. He produced The Help. Everyone knows The Help. Catherine Stockett from Jackson wrote the book and now lives down here at Churchill. But Tate has gone on to do so many other things. And he and his partner, John Norris, have brought to Natchez a new industry, a new energy, and it is the film industry and the film energy. There's an energy that comes with it, Marshall. It's a vibe, and it is overtaking our city big time. And because of that, you'll run into a lot of celebrities here. Uh, we've had a lot of Morgan Freeman sightings lately. Uh, because of them, we have other movie makers now coming and saying, hey, if John Tate liked Natchez so much, there must be something here for us. Just two weeks ago, I met with a movie maker for Hallmark, and he said, we've selected Natchez for our Christmas movie this year, uh, Searching for Christmas. They'll be here in August. Can you imagine that, Marshall? Yeah, because like Christmas, Christmas movie. in August. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, they said they wanted me in some of the scenes. I said, well, I'm flattered, but let it be... Uh, inside with air conditioning. I don't want to be in a Christmas sweater at Memorial Park in August. <laughs> Let me, and I say Memorial Park because we have so many beautiful Christmas lights year round there in the trees at Memorial Park. What Tate has done also is he has recognized here tremendous potential that has now become infectious throughout the community. You know, wow, if somebody like Tate Taylor's going to invest millions here, why don't we? And it's really taking over all of Natchez. We just a month or so ago signed a historic deal with them. We've been signing a lot of deals, Marshall, going through a lot of pens. We were on, um, on the bluff at the historic depot. Many will recall this old depot has been there for many years, this historic site. And it was home to a restaurant for many years. The Sidetrack restaurant was there a long time ago. And then Cock of the Walk was there. But for the last number of years, it's been sitting there vacant. Well, Tate and John and their group are now putting a million dollars into this city-owned building. And we have entered a long-term lease. It's not costing the taxpayers anything. And they're about to open, we hope by fall or late fall, the finest farm-to-table restaurant along the Mississippi River. And it will have beautiful vistas of that beautiful Mississippi. Um, and that's not all they're doing. They've opened their, they've moved their movie studios here. Their home headquarters is now here. They have uh, bought a local night spot called Smoots and given it new energy, new character, made it more of a multi, uh, what should I say? It is, it, it, it is for every demographic. It, it really, it, it will appeal to everyone. Uh, of every culture. And then they've also opened a fantastic restaurant spot called the Little Easy. And the lines have been crazy. We're having traffic problems there because uh, the lines have been so long. Um, Marshall, I got, I got to let you talk, man. What's next? I feel like I'm hogging the conversation. No, 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 no. You keep talking. That's great. Um, you know, the turning angel. I was just thinking about that. By the time you came in office, uh, you know, here you're coming in, you've won the election, you won it by, you know, 63.6%, which is a landslide, no matter who you're around. I mean, just oh, really okay. great. So the pandemic starts really kicking in, you know, we're having to quarantine, the, the economy's going south, you're just literally on the car going up the hill going, oh no, here we go. Tell us what the first couple months were going, you know, the turning angel gets, you know, knocked down. I mean, it's like everything in matches seemed like it was going wrong right at first, what, what were your first things that you did when you came into office? 
Gosh, well, you know, you mentioned the turning angel. And in fact, right behind me, I don't know if you can see it. I got a lot of pictures on all the walls of this old office here at City Hall, but I actually have a beautiful drawing done of the turning angel by a local artist, Mary Flash. And uh, Mary did this beautiful drawing to help raise money uh, and raise awareness when volunteers raise all the thousands of dollars to restore uh, the turning angel that had been, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately a victim of random Maybe, just yeah. kids, kids doing crazy things. It wasn't anything malicious. There was no malicious intent, but, but yeah, during the pandemic, it's not what the community needed when all this other stuff's going south. We had businesses closing left and right. We had, as everybody across America, we had people just holding up, not getting out. The city had pretty much gone underground. And in fact, our meetings were all virtual, mostly on the phone. Aldermen weren't seeing aldermen anymore. Uh, mayor, city officials, county officials, nobody was really seeing each other. And, and I told everyone, you know, we're going to prevail. We're going to come out of this. Natchez and I, over 300 years, have met every challenge, and we will meet this. And met it, we have. But the turning angel, Mary Flash's picture, do you know that when I came into my office uh, for the very first time, uh, there were two things waiting on me. Uh, uh, a plant, I think the plant's behind me, maybe, given to me by a local friend here. And, it, and we called the plant Sissy. <laughs> and there was also a beautiful signed print. Mary had brought me a print of the turning angel. I also had another gift and the gift was, uh, and I'm gonna get it, bear with me just a minute. And a gift was FedEx to me and literally a day or two after the election, this is on my doorstep. And it is a replica of what was on the Resolute desk when John Kennedy was president. And it was given to me by a guy I grew up with, David Pickenbotham. We were friends and Jackson grew up together. And it says, oh God, thy sea is so great and my boat is so small. I was overwhelmed. I will not lie. I was overwhelmed and some days I still am. But Marshall, we didn't have time to be overwhelmed. We just had to get to work. And so first of all, we planned an inaugural event. We said this inaugural is not going to be virtual. It's going to be in public. We wore our masks. We had the hand sanitizer out there, but we had it outdoors on the bluff and it was a beautiful day and it was a huge <clears throat> crowd. And there in front of everybody, we openly in public, they saw us. We took our oaths of office. We followed that up with our first board meeting that very day in our convention center. It was the first time they had seen the, uh, the board together a meeting in person in several months, since March when the shutdown had been, and this was July. The other thing we did was we said, uh, we are going to uh, disband the city task force on COVID, and we're going to get behind our county task force on COVID. Why did we do that? Because we wanted unity. There had developed some competition between the county and the city on how to deal with this pandemic. And I said, look, we're in this together and the city and the county must work together and we're going to work together. And that's exactly what we did. And we did not make a decision from then on until now without everybody being on board and being together. And I've got to tell you, our emergency management for Adams County, man and Colonel, he's a retired Army uh, Colonel in the National Guard, Robert Bradford, did a great job in helping us get through this COVID and working with me and also the Adams County Board of Supervisors. I became good friends very quickly with President Ricky Gray, who is the, uh, was the president of Board of Supervisors at that time. We had actually been on opposite sides during the election. We put, put all that behind us for the good of the county, of the city. And then uh, continued that when President Gray then passed the baton over to Angela Hutchins, who's now the president of the Adams County Board of Supervisors. And so with that, the city, the county, EOC, all of us on the same page, and we all agree, we're going to keep our economy open. We're going to educate people on this virus, how to get through it, 
but we will in no way support closing anything. It has to be open and we do it the right way. Obviously, we did some things right. In October, we hit a record tourism season and we had a great balloon festival during a pandemic. In Christmas, we managed to have various Christmas events. Even in spite of the pandemic, we had a Christmas parade in reverse. The parade was stationary and people drove through. We had about 700 cars come through that night. We just persisted. We're going to do this. And I guess we did everything right because Marshall, we now are celebrating historic numbers. We had posted as of just a month or two ago already over 500 new jobs, record number of business permit applications, new businesses, a record number of building permit applications, new buildings, new houses. We have also topped all numbers in real estate transactions and we have announced some major deals downtown and other areas of our city. But this is also the icing on the cake. In February, when so many communities around this nation were literally closed and hunkering down and scared to death, Natchez made the top 10 list. Forbes magazine voted us the, uh, I think we were number five on the list, one of the top places to visit safely during a pandemic. Uh, we, in April, just hit a record number on tourism, and our sales tax, our gaming revenue, and other revenue line items were through the roof, and we just couldn't be more excited. We had a meeting yesterday, went through our budget, spent an hour and a half going through our budget and everything, and we have balanced the budget, and we are running a surplus right now. Let me ask you about the budget just to get a little bit wonky here for a minute. There, what were some things that you saw when you came in and, and, you know, obviously you're working, it's a team effort, but what were some things that you saw that needed to be cut and what were some areas that you saved money um, initially when you looked at the budget? Well, I tell you, we, uh, when we first came in, I was very grateful. The uh, former mayor and board, because of the pandemic, had already put spending freezes in place and hiring freezes in place. And so we left those freezes in place until we could get a good handle on where we were financially. And getting a handle took a little time. Uh, the city was two years behind in its audits. And then quickly we were three years behind in our audits. Can you imagine that Marshall? So we uh, fortunately have a great city clerk. And the reason the city was behind, the city had gone through a transition through a number of city clerks over a four or five year period. We finally got us a, a really good one who's stuck around now. She's been here. She had been on the job. Uh, when I became mayor in July, she was in her first year, hit her first year, Mark, November. Savia Fordberry came to us from Macomb, and I already knew Savia uh, from prior experience up in Hines County in Jackson. Savia and I have worked together with a consultant that the city brought in named Wallace Collins, who does a lot of work up in Madison and, and helps uh, the city of Madison with their, their budget. And, uh, and so Wallace, Savia, myself, and several of our aldermen. And I want to tell you, our mayor pro tem, Dan Dillard, who is our senior alderman, has a better handle on that budget than just about anybody I know. Uh, Longtime alder woman, Sarah Carter Smith. Um, and, and we also are so grateful. We have a new alder woman named Valencia Hall, who defied all lives and won an amazing election herself last year. And wow, she has jumped in and really helped us. So the end result is we have gotten in these 10 months, two of those three audits done. And, and Marshall, they were clean audits. And we are now working on the third audit. And that will be unheard of to have gotten three audits done in one year, but that's our goal. We hope we make it. But what we found out is that during the pandemic, while yes, our revenues were down, because our spending was down and because we continue to keep it down through the fall, we were in good shape. And then when we hit October 
And we saw our sales tax spike back up because we had such a strong October. And then we continued to see upward trends and we started seeing the building permits. We've already surpassed our budgeted revenue for our business permits. It, it's crazy. We're getting so much action here. So all of that means increased revenue. But another thing we did, we rolled our sleeves, sleeves up very quickly. The city had not begun uh, assessing its expenses related to COVID. Well, we did that very quickly in the fall and submitted that. And we were able to get 369000 back uh, mm -hmm. from MEMA. And we're working on more now through FEMA. We put that money aside. We put other money aside. And what that has resulted in is, as I said, we are operating in surplus. Uh, we continue to do that, and we're going to keep it that way uh, without raising taxes. Uh, I'm not one of those guys who thinks you raise taxes to uh, have government work. Uh, no, like most Americans have to do every year, you live within your means. And just uh, before we go, if there is a person who just won us an election to become mayor in Mississippi or anywhere else that watches this, what advice would you give them? I, I would say, um, first of all, before you even take the job, you better love people and you better love helping people and you better not mind people knowing where you live, where you work, and what your phone number is. Because if you don't like all that, the job will wear you out. But if you like all that, and I love people, it will energize you. And that is, I think, what keeps me energized. Uh, Marshall, the number one thing, though, in loving people, be patient with people. Listen to people. Doesn't mean you've got to give everybody an audience just when they want one. I want to tell you, I have a low tolerance level for anyone who's out there just trying to do something for political uh, motivations. Uh, I call it political opportunism. It's tearing our country apart. People who really just pick something just because they want to make headlines and get everybody upset. I'm against that. And so, you know, I have a low tolerance of listening when it comes to that. So what I mean by that, though, is when people are legitimate and sincere, they may not agree with you. You may not agree with them, but find that common ground. Uh, it's important, yes, to be a great communicator. And that's what they called Ronald Reagan. In fact, they also called Barack Obama that. You know, it is important, yes, to be a great communicator. But I think it's more important. I, I really think it's more important to be a great compromiser. It doesn't mean you compromise on core values, on key things, fundamental beliefs. But when you're putting a budget together, when you're figuring out what to do, like I said in the beginning, at your city parks and where to do it and how to do it, be willing to compromise. And that means listening. If we would all in America do a little more listening, it would be amazing where we would go. Well, Dan, I've enjoyed listening to you today. Thank you so much for taking this much time out of your busy schedule to be able to visit with us. Um, looking forward to my next trip down to Natchez. I hadn't been down in a while because of the pandemic, but I can't wait to get back down your way. But congratulations. You're almost at a year, so it's not been a bad year. Yes, it hasn't. Marshall, I thank you so much. And, and listen, um, in closing, I've got to say one other thing. You know, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the people who prop me up and have my back. We have a longtime uh, friend here who happens to be one of our old women, Ben Davis. And uh, Ben ran unopposed. And that says a lot for Ben. And do you know that very quietly, he was one of my earliest encouragers. And I look now all over Natchez and I see so many early encouragers. Back when I didn't even believe in myself, and I just want to close by thanking you for this time, but also thanking all of those here in Natchez who believed in me. That's what gets me up every morning because I can't let them down. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. And um, like I said, everybody, if you get a chance, go down and see Natchez. Got a lot of great things going on. Appreciate it. You have a good day and thank you again. Thank you. God bless you.